right now on Full Custom Garage. It's this guy over here. Master Metal Man Ian Roussel looks back on the best builds of season one. When we first started the show, I didn't know what I was getting into. I got to do a ton of different projects, and I met a lot of really great people. He's just a guy that can take nothing and build it into something. That is phenomenal in my book. So it's the typical story of somebody's project dream car that just got in over their head. And you're gonna save it. That's what I do, sir. <laughs> I'm here to save the day. Hot damn, she loved it. She really, really loved it. It's way cool. I'm really glad he did this project. I, I didn't expect to see what I saw. With every project, I'm always trying to do some crazy stuff, you know, really push the envelope. Sometimes that gets me into trouble, but that's the fun part. One of the first projects I did was for my friend Bill. We took his 1948 International Truck Cab and we put it on a modern roll-off chassis. Not the easiest thing to do, a lot of heavy metal. The truck needed to be wider to fit on the frame, so I started with the front fenders. So we get this cab set up on the chassis and it looks bitchin'. I'm really happy with it. Bill's big concern is getting access to this engine. He really likes the idea of the old school trapdoor style hood. I think we should just go bigger. The whole plan here is the nose of the truck, the hood, the side panels, the fenders, the bumper, the lights, the kitchen sink. The whole deal slides forward and gets out of your way. You want to check the oil? There's nothing stopping you. I helped out on a build of a really cool truck, showed Bill a bunch of pictures of it, and I think we could use the same formula for this. Just upsize everything. We need to get this so that it's a sliding mechanism. I'm thinking like trailer hitch stock. It's like, see how you got these two square telescopic tubes? Oh. If we just had some generic material. You know, I have some tube down there on the pipe rack that I want you to take a look at that might work for that. That's the stuff, man. So my idea for the sliding tilt nose, I got this uh, trailer hitch receiver stock, and he has the, the interior section for that. See, it's different than the standard stuff because it's got rounded edges. So it slides on there pretty nice. I thought I'd take the rust off, but that seems like it acts as sort of a bearing. So uh, this will be incorporated to the truck frame, two of them parallel, and then I'll cut two sections of this off, and the whole nose will, will slide forward, and then there'll be pivots here. So it slides off of the front of the truck and then pivots up. It's a telescopic square steel tube. It's super strong. I have a feeling it's gonna work out perfect. Everything's simple in concept. <laughs> That's the realm I thrive in. Making it happen is a different story. This concept needed a lot of fabrication on the understructure just to get to the mock-up. I never built a tilt nose on a truck this big, so I needed to see it in action. Par for the course. All of this work, I finally get the thing ready to tilt, and it's stuck. Bill's standing right there. It's just perfect. It wouldn't move. It wouldn't move. And I went back to the, damn, it's so heavy, we can't do it. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, now what? When you got five million welds, your percentage of some attaching themselves to the cab, it's increased, so. In the end, that's what happened. The thing would not hinge open because it was welded shut. Like that. And it'll pivot up. Like that. There it is. You got a Ooh. tilt nose. <laughs> it is just awesome. Really cool. Everything I hoped it would be. Going for the KO, but I hung in there. It's bobbing, I was weaving, stuck in. Pulled it off. A lot of uh, blood, sweat, and tears by that young man right there. 
In the end, the truck worked out great. The thing I like most about it is the front view. Obviously, we know the fenders are widened, but you don't think that when you look at it. You just think, what a freaking big truck. There's not one thing I would change on this truck. I love everything about it. A lot of that is due to Ian and his persistence and his fabrication. It's a, a multi-functioning truck. It'll function as a flatbed truck, a dump truck, a van, does everything. Bill's truck turned out to be one of my favorite builds. The biggest satisfaction comes from the fact that it's a real working vehicle, and that's cool. Another project I did was a super custom 1964 Bug. It was based off a toy car someone gave me. One of the coolest custom pieces was the headlights and mounting brackets. These headlights are pretty crazy. They're actually pieces of spun aluminum that I found in the scrapyard. So I really made this whole unit. I had some glass lenses and I made everything else. They're seal bean bulbs that I glued in behind these antique lenses. So they're 12 volt high low beams. They look like vintage car parts, but uh, they're handmade, really badass. The other cool feature is the way they mount on the car. So it's a round tube. So they're adjustable up and down. You can move them in and out because you'll see when you steer, it's very close. Like so. And when the hood shuts, these strange little shapes clear the hood. You could really see the difference when we pulled it next to a stock bug. I really loved the stance and the radically chopped roof line. The thing I like most about the chop in the roof is just the radical nose down look of the whole thing. At first I was building the car for myself, but I listed it for sale and that's how I met Mark. He became a good friend and a long-term client. It's crazy, just crazy, man. My name is Mark Hayward. I'm from a little town outside of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. Thought we'd come all the way down to California and meet Ian and uh, pick up that beautiful little gem we got sitting over there. Oh, man. But I fit. You're about six foot two, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This is going to be all right, man. So this car here, I mean, I basically bought it sight unseen. It was just. Um, spur of the moment type of thing. Like I say, we corresponded on email and uh, he said, well, maybe you're interested in this Volkswagen I got. I mean, how could you not just take a one look at that thing? It's uh, phenomenal. Not only did Mark buy the bug, but he brought another project for me to work on. Oh yeah, I got something for you. I brought you something. Okay, I heard that there was a little treasure in the trailer. I got a little treasure in the trailer, all the way down from the frozen north. Oh, what the heck is that thing? That's a 51 Henry J. Holy moly. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen one. That's crazy, and it has no trunk. What kind of car doesn't have a trunk? We have lots of projects, both Viv and I, and uh, I'll never get to them all, so it's like, okay, let's give one to Ian and see what he comes up with. And if it's anything like that Volkswagen over there, we're going to get uh, a pretty nice hot rod out of this. Seeing his work, you know, through the video, seeing the car now in person. Yeah, I mean, I trust him 100%. I think it's just his creativity, and it gets down to his hands, and that's what he can fabricate and do. So, uh, yeah, I have full faith in him to turn that project we just left him here into something. He's just a guy that can take nothing and build it into something. That is phenomenal in my book. When I first met Mark, little did I know I would be working on some of the craziest projects, and this Henry J was just the tip of the iceberg. Next, I got started on Mark's Henry J, and it was all about chopping the top. It got pretty technical, but I knew I wanted to retain as much of the rear roof as possible, so I started in the front and worked my way back. I got the A-pillars all finished off. I'm committing to this chop. That's the height of the roof. I wasn't looking forward to cutting this roof and making it wider, but I think I'm gonna have to. I started looking at it 
and I found that this drip rail was actually tapered. So I think I can use this to my advantage. It looks like the drip rail is straight all the way through the door and then right at the B pillar, it starts to taper in. So if I was to attach the B pillar, trim it and pull the rear of the roof out, it'll go straight right back through. It would be easier to cut the drip rail off, but by leaving that, people are gonna think it's a stock part and then they're gonna start wondering. So that's what I gotta do, cut the whole roof lengthwise back to front. I thought this chop was gonna be a walk in the park. <laughs> I told the client it was gonna be like the VW bug I made for him, and that was easy. <laughs> Oops. You never know what you're gonna get into. The only way through it is to keep moving forward. So I'm just gonna cut up to the B pillar. I'll probably do a little relief cut on the inside and see if I can just twist a little, but I have a feeling I'm gonna have to go all the way to the front. This is a thing I'm unfamiliar with. I'm just feeling it out. I'm gonna make a relief cut on the inside of the structure and then just zip the sheet metal open and see when it moves. really delicate because in pulling this panel out, it could buckle the drip rail and I'm really trying to make it look right. That's the hard part. It's gonna work. I don't even have to cut ahead of the B pillar. I just put a trim on the back side of that structure and this guy will pull right over. I really lucked out. <laughs> Made a couple cuts, I pulled the thing and it snapped into place like it was meant to be. Yep, that's why I get paid the big money. Pretty cool. The thing is, it looks easy because I just cut it, but I've cut a lot of cars. I know how these panels flex, and that's why I made this decision. I'm just gonna weld it on there now, like I meant to do it that way. The cuts in the roof turned out to be a lot smaller than I thought they were going to be, and that was a huge relief. From there, it was just a matter of filling the gaps with sheet metal and finishing it off. This kind of work is really tedious, but it's the end results that really show what the effort was from the start. I think the end result with this chop was that it's very subtle. It could have gone really radical. It looks good from every angle, and that's what I was really trying to accomplish. My friend Don, his wife Patty's birthday is coming up. He wants to get her something really cool. Her family has a long history with dune buggies, so he's thinking about putting together one for her. It's going to be a total surprise for her. Um, growing up, her dad had a Myers Manx when they first came out, and my wife had a lot of good memories with that dune buggy out at Pismo and some of the uh, desert areas with that. Don is a car fanatic. His wife is a little more conservative. <laughs> He's always wondering what he's doing over here. He's got six million cars. I think that this dune buggy might seal the deal. It might win her over to our side. It's just gonna be epitome of driving around in something cool, you know, especially done by Ian, because he's so creative. Ever since I started this project, I've been thinking about the engine. Searching around at Don's, as usual, he's got so much stuff. I find an electric motor for a forklift. Just in a pile of parts, you know, there's this electric motor, there's a bunch of switches, speed controllers, just electric stuff. It just got me thinking. I mean, an electric dune buggy? Nobody's got that. A lot of my ideas seemed pretty crazy at the time, but actually pulling it off is, is the big challenge, you know? It's almost like there's a Jekyll and Hyde scenario. I had to make this electric motor work with the Volkswagen transaxle. I tried to make the simplest possible coupler. I used an old clutch disc and just welded it to a couple pieces of tubing. That fits the Volkswagen transaxle. What do you think about that? It's gotta work. 
I'm going off the standard VW gearbox, so it has a neutral, which is perfect. I don't have to worry about the tires spinning. So it's kind of a safety mode. I'm just gonna hook up the motor and run it. See what happens with no stress on it. It's such a bummer. It seems like anything that can go wrong will. This electric motor spins the reverse of what a Volkswagen engine does. That means we have four reverse gears and one forward gear. <laughs> it's in reverse now, which will make it go forward. It's something I need to figure out. Yeah, there it is. I'm not gonna get caught up in the fact that reverse is forward. Sometimes things go sideways for me. It's still gonna move. First gear is here. And then second gear, the electric motor was only gonna spin one way and that was backwards. So I put the car in reverse and I made four different voltages that spun the motor at different speeds. And then with four batteries, you'll have four gears. It should go a thousand miles an hour. I finished it up, painted it, and took it for a quick test run before I showed Patty. And it cruised great. I think it came out pretty cool. I couldn't wait to bring it to Patty and see her reaction. And here is your birthday present. Oh, I like the red. Hot damn, she loved it. She really, really loved it. It's way cool. I like that it's sparkly, and I like the red. The pinstripes and everything on it is really cool. Draws a lot of attention. It's way cool. I like it. I think my favorite thing that uh, Ian did with the car is going, going electric with it. I think that is just way cool. And it shows how talented he is. It's really cool to drive. It's a lot of fun. I love it. The cool factor about this whole build was that Patty's family was into dune buggies. I mean, for years, like old school when the thing first happened. So to restore this original survivor and give it back to her, it's like it came full circle. We're in Ventura, California. It's the Chopper Fest. Just looking around, see what's happening. I got a couple ideas of a bike I wanna build and I'm just seeing what's out there. Seems like the bike world's taken a couple turns in what's popular with style. For me, the 60s, 70s, the chopper thing that was going on is really the core of it. A big part of the chopper scene were these straight four engines, Hondas, Suzukis. Uh, Denver's Choppers was building frames for these kind of engines, and I just think it's cool. I wanna take that element of a really long bike, but make it a three-wheeler. Trike conversions have always been popular for motorcycles. It's really hard to get style into this three-wheel design, and I'm just gonna push my skills and try to make it happen. This project was all about the look, so once I got the engine and frame kind of figured out, it was really all about the seat and body shape. This bike has a solid rear end. It's a rigid, it has no rear suspension. I need a comfortable seat. I was looking around for seats, motorcycle seats, horse saddles, wheelbarrows, anything. You know, it just occurred to me, I've been sitting, working for 10 years, eight hours a day on this freaking work seat. I think it's perfect. I want the seat to be right on the axle. As soon as I put it in place, I was like, wow, it's low, low back, really wide. It's perfect. With the seat in place, I wanted to start building the fenders. Here is an improvised, arch maker. I need to create a radius around those tires. There's a lot of ways to bend tubing. Sometimes I just do a primitive. It works for me. Weld the end, flip her over, and roll out the barrel. This rim made the ring too small. So I'm just gonna stretch it out on this tire. It's always easier to open the arch up than to try to shrink it down. 
<laughs> so the idea here is to get this to be about just a half inch or an inch off of the surface all the way around the tire, kind of like here. So all you do is just start to beat on it. It's right about there. This puts an even half inch perimeter all the way around. You can see it swings down and then out and then back around, and it's all one panel. In the end, I'm gonna paint these fenders so they look like some kind of a carnival freak show. I want it to look like you're locked in on some kind of a wild ride. The whole thing with this is to look like a giant toy. It looks like a big wheel. It's one thing to think about a project, but to see it right there, it's great. It's what I live for. It was fun to take it to the Born Free show and see that other people were digging it too. Hot rods are a purely American thing. They started with early Fords, mostly. 20s and 30s Fords. As I understand, GIs came home from World War II, and they wanted to go fast. These were made from cheap cars that were just sitting around, just waiting to be hot-rodded. These cars are really desirable. They're making fiberglass reproductions, all steel reproductions, so to find an original, surviving, all-metal body, that's the best starting point. Ian and I have been friends for a while. We've worked on several projects together. He gets uh, excited coming over here to see all the projects that I have. I like things a little more simple, and Ian's way more creative. This is like ideal hot rod material. It's a little bit too far gone. You need it to restore it. All the mechanical parts are junk, but for a hot rod, this body is really good. One of the more unique things of this build was the roof. Every Model A has a hole in the roof. You can't get around it. One of the cool factors is it really gives you an opportunity to kind of make your mark. I've been looking around all over, trying to figure out what's going to be cool. Don's got a bunch of van roofs. Uh, he's got car hoods, car trunks, all kinds of stuff. Looking around, I come up on this Mustang hood, and it's pretty thrashed. This is a 69 Mustang hood. Uh, the car got wrecked. I cut it out about the same size as the roof opening in the Model A. It's got a neat crease down the center, and it's worthless as a replacement hood. The contour fits, and it's got this cool little detail in the, in the roof. The selling point to me was the ridge in the hood. The ridge in the hood immediately made me think of a 50s trick where they would put these little air vents in the roof of the car. So that's really what I was hoping to do. I mean, I already had this thing built in my head. When Ian was gone, I went ahead and I got some LED lights. In my absence, the hood scoop, this great styling element, has become a third brake light. Very interesting. I like the practicality of the safety part of it because the car sits fairly low, that I think that's going to work out really good. He wired some uh, wires up through the body, and he put these LEDs inside. In the end, it's all about craftsmanship. You know, that is a very custom third brake light. Oh, look at that. Boy, somebody will see me for miles away. Perfect. At the end of the day, Don was really happy. He's got a cool hot rod, and he loves to drive it. I'm really happy with the way this whole build went, because it's the car is easy to get in and out of. It's a nice car to drive. It handles well. It corners well. It stops well. And the wife can get in and out of it well. I'm just so tickled. I mean, I couldn't have asked for anything more, or a person of Ian's caliber to, to help me with my own personal project. The whole thing about 50s customs is the style, the flow of it, the silhouette. It's really an artistic thing. 
What most people are trying to do with these cars is make them look better than stock. Everybody has their opinion, and that's why no two cars are alike. My friend Bill had a 55 four-door Oldsmobile. The initial idea was to freshen it up a little bit, but of course, as things went along, it got a lot more involved. First, I chopped the top, and Bill really liked it. Seeing the roof three inches lower, I know I nailed it. But standing around looking at it, it just needs something else. I've already gone this far with the chop. It's a great looking car. I think its value has increased. If I go for two door conversion with the chop top, this thing is solid gold. Ian now wants to turn this into a two door. I really don't want this to turn into a big, huge project. I said to him, if you can do it in one day, great. On our way out to Riverside, California, uh, found a guy who's got a 55 Olds. It'll be perfect for this uh, four-door to two-door conversion I'm working on. Uh, hopefully, he's got the parts we need. Right on. I think that'll work. He had all the parts we need. We were able to cut off the, the back side of the door pillar and get the two doors, and also scored a new bumper. These doors were a lot longer than the original front doors, so I needed to see what it would take to make them work. Four-door to two-door conversion, it ain't easy, but I gotta do it like right now. I just gotta prove to Bill that this is gonna work. Fortunately, I got the door jam from the parts car that matches these doors. I know some of the dimensions are a little bit different, but I think I can pull it off. A couple bolts and the door fit. If this door didn't fit, I think we're going back to a four-door. I just assumed it would fit, and we lucked out. I used the stock rear door to complete the quarter panel, and Bill and I decided on a two-tone paint job. This car just needs something to put it over the top. I called my friend Scratch in. He's the best pinstriper I know. I think he's just going to finish this car to perfection. You know what? When I first saw the Oldsmobile, I'm walking up the up the hill to the to the shop, and the Oldsmobile sitting there in the middle of the sh shop space, and it just kind of brings me back. It's very nostalgic for me. I like that they hadn't changed the grill or anything just yet, and then they chopped the roof, so it already ha it has that look of. It's kind of fast, but it's elegant. Don't mess with me. Scratch really likes Oldsmobiles and traditional customs. I knew it'd be perfect to pinstripe this thing, but Bill was a little skeptical. What's your thoughts? I'm thinking kind of conservative, probably by your standards. Uh... Well, I'm super conservative. I know that I know that's hard to believe. It is. It's, 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 it's actually, it's really hard to believe, but. It's this guy over here. He's the wild man. <laughs> Scratch just explained what he had in mind, and Bill was totally on board. Oh, a lot of people don't know this, but pinstriping actually was an art form that was that was made up to cover up bad bodywork. So striping's always in the same places, in the front of the hood, in the middle of the deck lid, and that's where the emblems and stuff had been shaved off. And then over the headlights and over the taillights, because that's where they would French the headlights or French the taillights. But later on, custom bodywork was taking so long. People would have their cars at their shops for so long that they're like, let's just get a stock car, lower it, and do a panel paint job on it. Like, has a stock original paint around it, we'll just tape it all off and spray another color, or we'll tape it all off and just do striping around it. And that's basically what we're doing. I really like the pinstriping. It's subtle, but it came out great. Got the car finished up and on the road, and Bill was super happy. You know, with Ian, uh, every time I get him on board, none of these projects are simple. This was a huge, big undertaking. This thing was really rough, and he did a marvelous job on it. Just take a look at it. He really walked the last mile on it. 
I love the way this Oldsmobile looked when it was finished. It was pretty classy, nothing too crazy. Always cool to see a nice old car on the road. This next project was one of my own. It's a 1949 International Harvester Metro van. It's a delivery truck that I put on a modern pickup truck chassis. This episode was all about the interior. I've done a whole ton of work on this van, but for any cool custom van, it's all about the interior. And if you wanna have a party in here, this stuff ain't gonna fly. <laughs> I gotta fix it. The thing I like most about this, it's just funky. You don't see them. I've had VW buses since I was 15. I've always loved them. And this is like a big brother to a VW bus. It's like the next bigger size. It's able to tow. It has a good V6 engine with a manual transmission. It's the same idea as a VW bus, but rarer and cooler. My whole concept with this is like a dual purpose vehicle. During the week, it's a work truck, and on the weekends, it's a play vehicle. I want it to be able to convert from work truck to camper pretty easily. I called my friend Bob to give me a hand. Ian's working on a project, and he said he could use my help, and so I thought he'd come out and work with him again. Every time I get the opportunity, I'd love to come out. This is the start of the rear deck. Uh, the whole idea is these panels are gonna fold up and become the walls of the van when you're in work mode. And then if you go camping or whatever, this is actually a big mat. It's a big bed you can sleep on. I'm gonna work on fabbing up the structure out of angle iron. I came up with some material that could act as hinges. So Bob's gonna build the hinges and I'm gonna build a frame. This is a really simple barrel hinge design. It's just a solid shaft that fits inside of a collar. Bob's just cutting a bunch of blank pieces and making sure they pivot right. Since we're fabricators and body men, we, we don't like to go to the store and buy hinges when we can make them. I need some material for the walls. They're gonna be upholstered. I had a couple acrylic sheets, plexiglass. It'll work perfect. You could use pretty much anything. It's gonna be covered with vinyl in the end. I just cut it to fit and put a couple screws in it. What do you think, man? You need a couple bean bags, a few bongos. Cooler, full of ice cold beverages. I really thought about how this was gonna work and I decided by butting this frame up against the door jams, when I lifted them up, they were gonna clip into place and it worked. I'm really enthused about getting to work on it and uh, I'm really, glad he did this project, you know, for himself. You know, it's something really, really nice. The van's together. I got the airbags in, it's a driver. The big secret it's hiding is it's my old work truck. It's a 1988 GMC pickup truck. From the radiator to the gas tank, I modified the whole thing and put this international body over it. So it drives like a modern vehicle. It's got a Vortec V6 with a manual five speed. Airbags all around, it's a bitchin' ride. I chose this kind of oxblood color vinyl for the interior because I just thought it would look rich. You know, the exterior of the van is pretty mellow, but when you look inside, it's, it's pretty special. I spent a lot of time on the structure of the fold-down walls. I wanted them to be very usable, so this whole hinge and steel mechanism I came up with has proven to work well. The whole concept with this van is its usability. You know, it's not a show car. So the back is set up to load and carry whatever, or you can hang out in it. That's the whole idea with this. It's, it's a utility vehicle. I still have this van. I'm kind of glad I didn't get rid of it, because my friend Rich Evans is going to use it for his vintage flats paint company as a display vehicle. One of the craziest projects I did in season one was for my friend Victor. He wanted to make a custom bubble top for his 1962 Thunderbird. I'd never done it before, and creating a bubble that big turned out to be really difficult. In order to do it, I needed to build a massive oven in order to heat the plastic. Big challenge trying to figure out how to heat this thing up. I'm just hitting walls with it. I'm talking with Victor about it. And he said, well, we need some igniters or or elements. I said, I got some perfect elements. Let me just finish cooking my steaks. I guess his family barbecues a lot. You know, they have big family events. 
go on vacation. They, they do a lot of motorhome camping. And they got these two huge commercial barbecue grills. And he thinks that it's going to make it happen. Victor and I share a lot of the same characteristics. I think this barbecue thing might just be too much. <laughs> he's convinced it's going to work. All I have to do is prove it. Each grill has two propane tanks, so we'll have four five-gallon propane tanks, which should be plenty of capacity. As long as these guys get that volume of air warmed up, it should work. All you can do is try. We're either going to have the right amount of heat or not enough. We'll see. It makes some heat. Let's, uh, let's put the lid on. In keeping with the low-tech approach, I've got some plumbing pipe simple gauge and some air fittings. The idea is to just create a controlled air source to inflate this thing. Target temperature for this is 375 degrees to get the plastic that hot. I had the idea that this laser thermometer would be a perfect way to check out the temperature and yeah the readings are consistent. It's heating up and it seems like it's gonna happen. Pretty weird, this huge sheet of plastic, as it heats up, is starting to deform. It's getting like all wobbly looking and just putting a little bit of air pressure in it. And just strategically putting the air in and heating it up and I walk up out of coming from a project that I was on and I said, Ian, crank it up, let's take it to the limit. Yes, Captain, taking it to the limit, take it all as requested. <laughs> that didn't work. Shut her down. I turned my head for a second, and it was like, what was that? Within two minutes, the thing started tweaking and blowing, and I pretty much, I could see the look on Ian's face, like, what the hell did you make me do now? Shut everything off. It's going to melt the plastic real bad. I quick turn around, peeking in the hole. I can't even see what's going on. I just, I'm seeing sheet metal. I don't know what's going on because the whole thing appears to have collapsed. The whole thing's collapsing. I don't know what to do. I stuck my arm back in the oven to hold the thing up and kind of get a look, and it's just destroyed. We got to lift the lid up and see what went wrong. It looks like the metal and everything tore right out of the roof of the box. It tore off the lid. So we actually damaged and warped the first mold. I said, you know, just crank the pressure on it. That was the wrong thing to do, but hey, it's a good story. <laughs> <laughs> this thing was twice as big before this broke. So what happened was we lost air pressure and it shrunk. What a bummer. To most people, this thing looks like an utter failure. I'm gonna work through it. After it got destroyed, we rebuilt the mold and made it a lot stronger. Typical Victor style, he wanted to push the whole thing further and make an entirely new shape. The good thing is this is working just like all the rest. The heat's even, the thing's inflating, it's looking good. Oh, the front, look at this, amazing. We're there. I can't push it anymore. We're gonna raise it up. It's the moment of truth. Oh, we got it, man. Look at that. Yeah, see, that's what I was looking for. Everything looks great. It's back into shape. The whole idea is to just cool it off, raise it up out of the box, and unclamp this beast. I took this half-inch MDF board and created a series of templates off of the bubble Victor liked most. I spaced them out eight inches apart, made a whole bunch of support to withstand the pressure of this bubble pushing against it, and fastened it to the backboard. Getting the buck off of this thing really revealed that it was a successful idea. This was uncharted territory, and the result was ideal. That's pretty crazy. But the real tell is gonna be how it fits on the car. That's what this is all about. This 
car has been in the works for a long time. It is a concept car. It's gone through so many phases of development, and now to have it finally wrapped, I'm stoked. The car came out amazingly beyond my expectation. On the bubble top, the interior, this is a total custom build. The bubble top is next level. The car is, like I said, a piece of art. I mean, the car is a masterpiece. I saw Victor pull in the driveway with this thing. I was like, get out of the way, mister. I want this car. Well, Ian, when he came in and seen it, all of the ideas all came together, and he was impressed. The thing drives up, and it looks like a spaceship. I wish it didn't have tires. You open the bubble top, and the interior is just going off. There's all kinds of crazy stuff going on in there. I'm ecstatic. He's ecstatic with it. Everything flows just perfect. The first season was a ton of work, <laughs> but I'm used to that. The thing was the great unknown. We just threw it out there to whatever might come in the door, and it really was a great time. A little behind the scenes thing in season one was that I got my shop inspector, got my number one dog. I think you can have a snack and then just mosey on out on your own accord. I was super nervous about having some kind of responsibility. And it's turned out to be a really fun time. The coolest factor about having the dog on the show is that that's the reality. <laughs> it's really just him and I hanging out in the shop. Hey. You're not the center of attention. This is my show. It's like baby pictures, right? You can sit here and boast about your accomplishments forever. But, you know, it is what it is. He's pretty damn charming. <laughs>